Welcome to Berkeley Labs Live Science Series, an opportunity to share hobbies, demonstrations, and innovative research. My name is Elisa Vitale, and I'm the Content and Instruction Coordinator for our K-12 Outreach and Education Programs, part of our Government and Community Relations Office here at Berkeley Labs. As you begin, I'd like to share some reminders about the series. First, we've turned on our live transcription. You'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that allows for closed captioning during the session. Second, if you haven't downloaded already, we have an accompanying info sheet that you can find on our Berkeley Lab K-12 STEM Education Outreach website. The website was just posted in chat box now, and we encourage you to use the chat box not only to click on links, but also to ask questions. We'll be checking for your questions and comments throughout the session. As you can see from today's agenda, we have a lot of exciting segments and we hope you can stay with us for the whole session. But in case you do have to pop off, we are recording the session. You will be able to find a recording on our website next week, along with our previous life science sessions that covered numerous topics such as soil science, star formation, and particle physics. For our agenda today, we're now going over our introduction, and then we'll take a fun journey with a microscope and RV recreational vehicle to explore symbiosis. After hearing what the Berkeley Lab community is doing to take care of Earth, we'll learn more about microbes and their large impact on the Earth's environment. Finally, we will have a panel discussion with some students who will share their experiences in environmental research and internships. For those of you joining us for the first time, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is one of 17 national labs funded by the Department of Energy. Berkeley Lab is recognized with 14 Nobel Prizes and credited with the discovery of 16 elements on a periodic table. This year, Berkeley Lab is celebrating its 90th anniversary. You can see us on this map created by Symmetry Magazine. National labs were created to bring researchers together in order to share expertise and sometimes very large and expensive equipment to tackle big problems. We like to call that team science here at Berkeley Lab. If you have a chance, you should check out this interactive map at symmetrymagazine.org to learn a little bit more about each of the laboratories. Here you can see an aerial view of Berkeley Lab, and we like to call this the best view from the lab. We are sandwiched between Lawrence Hall of Science and UC Berkeley. If you are interested in hearing more about the labs or facilities and research, you can join virtual public tours, which you can find on Eventbrite. Today, in celebration of Earth Month, we will be learning about microscopic exploration, use AR technology to look at plankton, and hear from the next generation how they are conducting their own research. And throughout today's session, we'll be hearing a few words over and over. Bacteria, commensalism, carbon sequestration, Coccolithophore, microbes, microorganisms, mutualism, parasitism, and symbiosis. These words will be defined throughout the session and are also defined on the downloadable info sheet. Now, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. John Marie Bullock, who is a project scientist at the Joint Genome Institute, or JGI. He went on an amazing trip with his family along the coast of California and used a microscope to take a look at some cool microbes. So John Marie, welcome. And can you tell us more about yourself, your research and your trip? All right, thank you very much, Elisa. And uh, hi everybody. I'm very happy to be uh, here with you and to uh, meet you all virtually during this live science session. And um, yeah, my name is Jean Marie. I'm a marine biologist. And as you can maybe hear, I'm, I'm not from the US. I'm actually from France. And for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna try to give you an idea of what it's like to be a scientist, to do marine biology. And uh, yeah, one of the cool things, uh, for instance, about doing science is that you get to travel a lot. So here on the map on the left, you can see, for instance, the, the five different countries where I lived uh, with my family to do research over the last 10 years or so. So my research and my role as a, as a scientist is to try to understand how different organisms live together in a long-term uh, association that we call symbiosis. And on the next slide, I'm gonna show you the three different types of uh, symbiosis. So there is three categories, depending on how happy or unhappy the two partners uh, of a symbiosis are. In the first category, it's called parasitism. The small partner, which we call the symbiont, is usually getting some benefits. He's happy about the symbiosis. But the second partner, which we call the host, in, in the case of this example, those are lice living in our heads. The host, uh, which is basically us, we are not very happy about having lice. 
So in this case, one is getting some benefits and the other one is not, and this is called parasitism. In the second category, which is maybe less famous, it's called commensalism. One partner, the host here, is neutral about the symbiosis, and in this example, the host is a shark, and a symbiont, which is a small remora fish living attached to the shark close to its mouth, is getting some benefits. So the, the remora fish is getting a free ride, traveling, traveling long distances and without uh, spending much effort, but the host is not uh, neither happy on, or unhappy. This is commensalism. And now in the third category, which is the one that I study, the one I'm uh, interested in, uh, both partners are getting some benefits out of the relationship. It's called mutualism. And in this example, a cleaner shrimp uh, is uh, getting the, the, the teeth of the fish clean. And it's uh, basically eating the leftovers that are uh, in between the, the teeth of the fish. And, and the fish in return is getting a free teeth cleaning. So they are both getting something out of the deal. It's mutually beneficial. It is called mutualism. And on the next slide, I'm going to give you a real life example that we encountered during um, uh, our research. And I'm going to quiz you to see if you actually uh, can find out which type of symbiosis that is. So here we were diving in the Indian Ocean and we were collecting uh, teeny tiny uh, jellyfish for a research project when we got the visit of, uh, of a, a, a humpback whale, which uh, is coming from down below. And you can, see, you can see it better here on this picture. And the reason why I'm showing you this picture is because if you look more in detail uh, at this area here, you can see that there are some white round shaped uh, things attached to the whale. And these are actually um, symbionts. It's a different species. It's a different organisms uh, that lives attached to the whale. They are called barnacles and they filter the water to catch small prey uh, for nutrition. So here's the quiz for you now. What do you think the relationship between the whale and the barnacle is? Do you think that one partner is bothered by the other one and then it's called parasitism? Do you think that one is neutral and the other one is getting some benefits? Then that would be commensalism. Or do you think that they are both getting something out of their symbiosis and then it would be a mutualism? So I guess we're gonna give you another 10 or 15 seconds to vote, I guess. And we look at the results together and I'm gonna tell you what it is. All right, so it looks like most of you got it right, but there are some also who uh, chose mutualism. So actually it is most, uh, most often it is considered a commensalism because the whale, uh, just like the shark, uh, doesn't really care about having a, a few barnacles attached to it. And, um, and the barnacle, however, is getting, again, a free ride and constant flow of seawater to catch little prey that are free living in the water. But in some case, actually, it is also a mutualism because when uh, the whale is covered with some barnacles uh, on some um, specific area of its body that can be attacked by predators, the barnacles can act as an armor and protect the whale. So you see, in some case, the, the category can change. And now we're going to go to the next slide and, and look at a, a second example, which is a very famous symbiosis between the, the clownfish and the sea anemone, which you may be familiar with, uh, at least if you've seen the movie Nemo, for instance. So the clownfish are the symbionts and they live in between the tentacles of the anemone. They don't get uh, stung by the, the anemone. So they live happily in this. Uh, nice funny house and the question is do you think that this type of symbiosis is a parasitism a commensalism or a mutualism and again parasitism would be uh, one partner is getting some benefits while while the other one is not uh, happy about it the commensalism would be one partner is neutral and the other one is happy and mutualism would be both partners are getting something out of the deal. All right, so that's very good. And we have also uh, two votes for parasitism and something commensalism, but it is indeed, it is a mutualism. And in this case, it's a pretty elaborate uh, uh, relationship, a pretty, uh, uh, it's a long-term relationship between the sea anemone and the clownfish. The anemone 
uh, let the fish live in between its tentacle because the fish cleans the anemone from uh, small parasites. So that's good for the anemone. And, uh, and the fish, uh, in return, gets a home with protection from the tentacles. So there uh, are no predators that want to come uh, close by to eat the clown fish. And uh, yeah, another benefit for the anemone, which sounds a little bit weird for us, but the clown fish actually poops on the anemone. And that is actually good food for the anemone. So there's really benefits on both sides. It is a mutualism. So we are going to go to the next slide. And here are many more examples. So there are just five of them here, but there are actually tons of symbioses in the sea and anywhere on the planet. And in most cases, uh, probably, the, the host uh, is living in symbioses with symbionts that are so small we cannot see them with the naked eyes. They are microbes. They are microorganisms. They are microscopic. So here are five examples of uh, beautiful or weird looking symbioses from the sea. And now we're going to let you choose which one of these uh, symbioses you want to hear about. So we're going to make that a little bit more interactive. And you're the one deciding how the next explanation is going to go. And you can pick. So pick just the one you are the most curious about or the one you find weird or beautiful. I like them all. So I can tell you a little bit more about any of them. The bobtail squid is very small. It's just, I think, one or two inches. It's very tiny. OK, the upside down jellyfish seems to be the most popular. It is indeed a very cool uh, jellyfish. So jellyfish are normally uh, these um, almost transparent creatures that live um, uh, completely on the other uh, side. So they have the tentacles uh, towards the, the bottom of the sea and not upwards, like here. And the tentacles in jellyfish normally are used to uh, catch small prey like fishes or plankton and bring them to the mouth and eat them. But this jellyfish has decided to um, get a completely different lifestyle and it lives upside down and it hosts inside of the tentacles, it hosts probably millions of microorganisms. They are min mini, teeny, tiny uh, algaes, microscopic algaes that give the green color to the jellyfish. So the reason why it lives upside down is that it's giving access to light that is coming from the surface to its microbial symbiont. And the microbial symbiont, the algae, they make photosynthesis, just like plants on, on land. They use the energy of the sun to uh, transform carbon that is in the ocean or in the atmosphere into sugars. And some of these sugars it is then given to the jellyfish as food. So they are both getting something out of the deal. It's a mutualistic relationship. All right, so we're going to go to the next slide, and I'm going to let you choose another system that uh, you can pick from uh, these seven examples, and I will let you know a little bit more about them. And while you're voting, I'm going to let you know a little bit about these weird creatures. So they are all coming from the deep sea. They are coming from miles down uh, the sea, uh, in, in a, so, so deep down the sea that there's actually no light that can penetrate that far. So they live in complete darkness. That's why the Rimikeri shrimp, for instance, is completely white. There's no need to have fancy colors when there's no light to see colors. And all these creatures are living in these extreme environments where there is pretty much no food because there's no light. So there's no plant or algae to grow. And they can all sustain and live there because they have symbiosis with some bacteria. And I'm going to tell you more about these bacteria in a minute once you have decided which system you want to hear about. OK, so the system that yeah, there's uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, it's pretty even. So the Pompeii worm still is the winner. And it looks a bit weird. That's probably why maybe you chose it. <laughs> so the Pompeii worm, like actually the giant tube worm and the, the Lamellibrachia worm, uh, number four, they are all worms living in the deep sea around hydrothermal vents, which are these very extreme environments. It's pretty much like a underwater volcano at the bottom of the sea. And there are cracks from the seafloor where very, very hot uh, water, which is full of sulfur, which is normally toxic for animals, is coming out. And these worms, they have symbiosis with bacteria, which actually like the, the warm, uh, sulfur-rich water. So the worm is living just in between the warm water, which is full of sulfur, and the cold water, 
which is full of oxygen and is doing this uh, back and forth traveling between these two environments to give oxygen and sulfur for the bacteria. And the bacteria, because the bacteria are so small, they cannot move otherwise. So it's very good deal for the bacteria. And the bacteria in return use that uh, chemical energy to make sugars or, or other kinds of foods, and they transfer some of that nutrition to their host. And I think that's it for this slide. So we're going to move to the next one. And I'm going to show you now the type of system that I study in the lab. And because I cannot really go to the deep sea, I, I don't have a ship to explore the extreme environment of hydrothermal vents in the deep sea. So what we do is we look for systems that are right on the shore, on the, on the, on the coast, sometimes on the beach. And all these systems that you see here are all living in shallow waters. So if you see this uh, bottom left uh, ball here, it's a, it's a single cell ciliate and all covered with these small rod-shaped bacteria. Those, these are the symbionts and you can see them because this picture is taken with a microscope. So I'm collecting all this system, and on, on the next slide, I'm going to tell you about how we do uh, the sampling, how we collect these things, and how we find them, discover them, to study them. And uh, to, to find such systems in California, where I live right now, we organized a trip, uh, a field trip, a sampling trip. And here is a question for you that you can uh, answer in the chat box. How would you like to travel when doing research? So I'm going to give you uh, some minutes to come up with ideas that could be on a boat. Indeed, that's not a bad idea. Yes, but it was not with a boat this time because those systems I want to collect are actually um, very close to the shore. So it's even easier to access them from, from the coast. So we didn't use a boat. We used actually going to see that on the next slide we uh, used a rv and we organized a, a work family trip because you know it was covid time so we could not go and visit labs uh, uh, in those uh, other cities in los angeles or in san diego so we decided to take the lab with us in the rv we put some microscopes and i left with my wife she's also a scientist and our daughter and we stopped at all the places that we wanted to explore to collect samples and on the next slide, we are going to see a short video about the trip. And I hope this is going to give you a better idea of how this uh, happened. So this is the RV that we rented in uh, close to San Francisco. And we loaded the microscopes, some dissecting equipment, and everything that we need to collect and, and start to analyze samples. We stopped at a, at a shop, diving shop, to uh, ran some diving gear and and here we are meeting with a dive master from uh, from los angeles he's here on the video and he took us uh, to dive uh, in this place called white point beach which is an interesting place because there are um, hydrothermal vents just like in the deep sea but these are in shallow water so we went down in only uh, about 30 feet of water and we looked for cracks in the in the seafloor where we could feel hot water coming out. So after about 20 minutes of diving and searching for the vents, we found one of them, actually several of them, and we recognized because there was very hot uh, uh, water coming out of these cracks and also those white bacteria that looks like hair growing around it. So we took the samples back to the RV and we looked at them with the microscopes and after collecting for about one hour uh, underwater, we uh, basically we spent about five hours, uh, the three of us with my wife and even my daughter was helping. We looked at what we collected and we dissected the giant bacteria. So these white uh, filaments that you can see here using the, the microscope, they are giant bacteria. You can even see them with naked eyes, but we can see them better with the microscope. And we think that maybe they have uh, interesting symbiosis with different kinds of bacteria. So we collected many of them. We had even the help of very young scientists, as you can see here. And we collected hundreds of samples that we uh, kept in the fridge and brought back to the lab uh, at the Berkeley lab for uh, you know, further analysis. So this, I think, concludes my, my presentation. And I hope I gave you a good overview of um, what it's like to be a marine biologist and, and uh, convince you that they are really fascinating creatures 
that are living in symbiosis uh, in the marine environment. And if you have questions, I think we have maybe one or two more minutes to take questions. So feel free to ask me, uh, I guess, in the chat box what you want to know. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions for John Marie, now is your chance, pop in the chat box and I'll make sure to get to and ask uh, John Marie here. But uh, while we're waiting for questions, actually, um, here's a question. Oh, a question came in. What was your daughter doing in the video right now? You're <laughs> the young scientist, what was she doing? All right, so she's actually uh, doing what we were doing, my, my wife and I, and I just before. So we were uh, collecting those white bacteria, those, those filaments, and she's using tweezers to take them out of the rocks, they're attached to the rocks, and then she's pipetting them and putting them in a tube. So she was helping us collect the samples, basically. And this That's is another amazing. one. Another yeah. question is, uh, did you discover something unexpected? Yes, we actually did. And I, I forgot to put the picture. That's a pity. So we found uh, a very uh, funny uh, snail. I think you call it sea snail uh, in English that was living right in the environment of the hydrothermal vents. And it was basically walking with, a, you know, with its shell. Um, it was walking in between the bacteria and bacteria were growing on the shell of the mollusk, on the shell of the snail. So we think this is maybe a new type of symbiosis that, that we didn't know before. And we took one, unfortunately we had to kill it to bring it back to the lab. And we're gonna study that now. What is an average day like as a marine biologist? So yeah, so that what you saw in the video is maybe not a, a, a normal day. It's maybe once or twice a year, we'll go to the field and do all this cool diving stuff. And most of the time we're in the lab and we analyze the samples. We look at them using microscope. We also work at the computer. We read a lot to see what other scientists are doing. Uh, and yeah, and we, and, and we exchange, we discuss with other, other scientists. Maybe one or two more. That's when did you discover your interest in the field? That's a good question. I was not interested at the beginning in marine biology at all. I was, uh, I was, however, living on a tropical island and I liked uh, diving very much and surfing and doing, you know, all kinds of stuff um, uh, in Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. And at the beginning, it was uh, biology was the only thing uh, that I could study that was a little bit interested in and that could allow me to stay. So I, I chose that. And after, you know, studying biology, I got into it and it became a passion, passion, passion. Uh, I got very interested in it, <laughs> and that's how I became a marine biologist. That is awesome. Thank you so much for answering those questions, and thank you to our audience for those amazing questions as well. Again, as a reminder, you can always pop in questions in the chat box. I'll make sure to get into it. Thank you so much, John Marie, for thank you. being thank here. You. So for our stretch break, uh, we have a video featuring some Berkeley Lab staff and scientists who want to share how they are taking care of Earth. One of the ways that I'm helping to create a more sustainable world is by learning more about renewable energy policy. And one of the ways that I'm doing that is by reading this book called Short Circuiting Policy by Leah Cardamore Stokes. It's super informative and I think it'll help me better understand how policy decisions get made and how I can be a part of those policy decisions. Here are some ways our family takes care of the earth. Cleaning up trash at the shore, cooking plant-based meals, using reusable cloth for napkins, bags, and masks, carpooling, mending our clothes when we can, creative use, reuse of materials for art projects, reducing plastic consumption, learning about solar energy, and working at Berkeley Lab where we bring science solutions to the world. So thank you to everyone who submitted videos. Hope everyone had a great stretch break. So before the stretch break, we saw John Marie go on an RV journey along the coast of California. They were observing all these different microbes using a microscope. Most of us though don't have a microscope at home. So a question for everyone, 
is what is something at home that you can use that's like a microscope? What do you think you have something at home that you can use like a microscope? Answer in the chat box. Any guesses on what you can use at home? We got a camera. The very, yes, you can actually probably zoom in a lot with a camera. That's a good guess. A magnifying glass. Great answer. Yeah, so um, if you check out our down Loadable worksheet, there's a link on there to some cool, relatively cheap lens that you can clip to your phone so using your phone like a camera, or you can even challenge yourself to try out a DIY microscope tutorial. But today we're going to share with you all Planktomania, which is an augmented reality app that lets you take a closer look at microbes in the ocean. So instructions to download the app are on the worksheet, but we'll also be demoing how the app works to you all in just a bit. But first, I would like to introduce everyone to Dr. L. Barnes, a postdoctoral researcher at the Joint Genome Institute. Hi there. Um, and she is going to tell us more about how impactful ocean microbes are to the Earth's environment. Um, L, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So hi, everyone. I'm L. Barnes, and I'm a microbial ecologist. I'm interested in how microbes associate with a host like you and me, or say a salamander, like I used in my PhD, or a plant, like the biofuel crops, which I work on now as a postdoc at the Joint Genome Institute. So using genomics, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, I work to understand the factors in the environment, on the host, and between different microbes that create massive amounts of microbial diversity on the planet, and how this might affect the functions that they have. So now we're gonna take a look at some of these microbes in AR. All right, so first up is Emiliania huxleyi, or E-hux for short. And E-hux is a single-celled alga that is covered in a shell of ornate scales made from calcium carbonate. But you might know calcium carbonate more simply as chalk. And these cells are called coccoliths by scientists. And this makes EHUX a microorganism known as a coccolithophore. And we'll learn more about EHUX a little later on. So hopefully everyone's able to explore EHUX with planktomania. So next up is Prochlorococcus. Pro Prochlorococcus is a cyanobacteria, which is like a plant-like bacteria. And this single group of marine microbes is responsible for about five to 10% of the photosynthesis that happens on earth today. About 3.5 billion years ago, it evolved the ability to split water and release oxygen into the atmosphere. And this is a process that we now call photosynthesis. Okay, so without this microbial innovation, ah, uh, here we go, now we can see perchlor caucus. So without this microbial innovation, and yes, this microbe existed before land plants, so it was doing photosynthesis before then, there wouldn't be oxygen in our atmosphere, and we certainly never would have evolved. So next up is Osteococcus, and Osteococcus is a very, very small type of phytoplankton known as a picoplankton. And they're actually the smallest free living alga known to science with an average size of less than one micron in diameter. So for reference, a single strand of hair on your head right now is about 75 microns across. So Osteococcus are found at the top of the water column close to where plants live, but there are also now being discovered some deep water species and their cell structure is very simple. Scientists call them naked, which simply means that they don't have a cell wall like other green algae. They also just have one chloroplast, which is the cell part that's responsible for photosynthesis and one mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. And lastly is the bacteriophage, which is sometimes called phage for short. Now bacteriophage are enemies of bacteria the word phage means to devour. So a bacteriophage means devourer of bacteria, which is a really cool name. They're a form of virus that infects and replicates within the cells of bacteria. Bacteriophages are extremely common and very diverse, and it's estimated that 10 to the 23rd viruses infect a cell every second. 
So again, for reference, that's a one followed by 23 zeros. A billion is only a one followed by nine zeros. So each type of phage is very specific about what bacteria they prey on. And some bacteria phage and other viruses can be very helpful because they help to control the numbers of bad bacteria that we might have in the environment. So that was really cool. And this is just another example of how you might be able to learn about microorganisms without a microscope. Okay, so now I'm gonna focus on one of the microorganisms that you just saw on the app, EHUX. And remember, EHUX is a special type of phytoplankton known as a coccolithophore because it has this shell. So as an abundant marine alga, EHUX forms the base of the ocean food web using light from the sun and carbon dioxide in the air to perform photosynthesis. And because of their really large populations, these algae convert carbon dioxide into many forms of stored carbon, some of which they use to make those shells that they wear during a process known as calcification. And so through these two processes, photosynthesis and calcification, EHUX is responsible for both storing and releasing carbon in the oceans. And under the right conditions, EHUX populations can grow very large, creating what's known as an algal bloom. Because of their really light colored shells, they reflect massive amounts of sunlight, which you can see here, literally shining bright like a diamond, which has been picked up by NASA's space satellites. And that's a real image there. So that white film in the ocean is actually lots of EHUX in the water. However, these blooms can have quite an ecological impact, affecting not only the carbon cycle, but also how sulfur moves, the ocean's temperature, and access to light in the deep ocean. So right now you might be wondering, are all of our oceans just a giant soup of EHUX? So let's pose the question. How many microorganisms do you think exist in a single liter of ocean water? And for reference, I have here a little liter of water, right? So how many microorganisms do you think exist in the, could exist in this liter of water? 100, 100,000, 1 million, or more than a billion? Go ahead and vote in the poll. All right, okay, so most of you got it right. That's correct. It is 1 billion or more. And actually 1 billion microorganisms is probably a low estimate. Today, scientists now estimate that one liter of water contains 1 billion bacteria and 10 billion viruses. So that's a lot of life going on in just that one liter of water. Okay, but wait, back to my question. So are the oceans just a giant microbial soup of EHUX? And the answer is no. And that's because coccolithophores like EHUX have a microbial enemy that has evolved alongside them over millions of years and they're known as coccolithoviruses. And when they arrive, they can cause EHUX blooms to crash. So like all viruses, coccolithoviruses infect the host and replicate within the safety of the host's own cells. And when the viruses have finished replicating, they burst out of the EHUX cells, causing EHUX to die. So EHUX's calcium carbonate shells fall to the ocean floor where they can stay for many, many years. And because this carbon remains within the coccolith shells, oceans are a major site of a very important process that I've listed here on the slide known as carbon sequestration or more simply carbon storage. And so carbon sequestration is good for our planet and we'll see why on the next slide. And this is because uh, it is uh, helps us to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that builds up in the atmosphere. Thanks for changing the slide back. And this carbon dioxide and a few other gases are capable of trapping the sun's heat, like a greenhouse, right? So this is why scientists call them greenhouse gases. And this process warms up our planet, normally making it a nice place to live, but too much carbon dioxide makes it too warm and contributes to these environmental problems like climate change. So 
Remember though, that these processes that are happening are really dynamic and that this carbon that's stored deep in the ocean will eventually be recycled back through the planet. But for now, as you can see on this image, we can marvel at the massive amounts of coccoliths or ehuk shells that have built up over time to create geologic wonders like the cliffs of Dover in England. And so researchers at the JGI study these microbes and work with scientists around the world to uncover how they might interact. And in fact, we now know that not all ehucks are created equal. And in an evolutionary race to outsmart the coccoliths some ehucks can switch to a virus resistant form, essentially becoming invisible to the virus. And the scientists that discovered this named this process the Cheshire Cat Strategy after the disappearing cat in Alice in Wonderland, which I just think is a great name. So this is just one part of the global carbon cycle. Carbon is a really important part of all life, and it's constantly moving through different environmental pockets, as you can see here in this image. So as humans, we also contribute to the carbon cycle when we consume food, drive cars, and burn fossil fuels, which you can see on the left. But some of this carbon dioxide that we release gets taken up by plants through photosynthesis and stored in the soil. And this is what makes forests really important ecosystems on the planet. But what many people don't know is that 25% of the carbon dioxide released through our activities is actually taken up by the ocean. And some of this carbon dioxide returns to the atmosphere, but much of it is moved to the deep ocean, thanks to these phytoplankton, where the storage of carbon is 50 times larger than that of the atmosphere. And so for this reason, the ocean provides a vital service to our planet, and it's important to study these processes and the organisms contributing to them. A change in any of these parts could have a really big impact on Earth's ecosystems and our climate. Okay, so now another question for the audience. Which ecosystem do you think absorbs more carbon dioxide? Terrestrial forests? or oceans. And you'll notice that I specified by saying terrestrial forests because there actually are coastal forests or ocean forests, and those are called the mangrove ecosystem, right? So how much do you think gets absorbed? Which is more, terrestrial forests or the oceans? Okay, great. Most of you were correct. It is the oceans. It's estimated that over 80% of global carbon is moved through the oceans and their coastal habitats. So that's about 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide being absorbed by the ocean every year. Now, this isn't to say that forests aren't important. It's just the ocean is really, really large, so it can store a lot of carbon. So now I'm going to tell you about how the Joint Genome Institute contributes to this knowledge through its large-scale genome sequencing projects. But uh, what is genome sequencing and why should you care about it? Well, every organism's genome is unique, like a fingerprint, allowing us to identify the organism's species, as well as how they're related to the other organisms that we might sequence. Additionally, the order of the chemical letters in their genome, known as the sequence, tells us about what that organism is capable of doing, sort of like an instruction manual, helping us to understand their function in the environment. So in this way, genome sequencing allows us to discover novel genes, proteins, and pathways, while also improving our understanding of biodiversity, or the total number of species on the planet. And uncovering how these microbes function in their environment also holds tremendous potential for transforming our understanding of the world we live in, and may even lead us to some innovations in energy and the environment. So how is this done here at the JGI? Well, First, scientists grab a sample from the environment, and this can be from soil, water, or microbial culture. Then we use chemicals to open up the microbial cells and extract out their DNA, which is again, like that instruction manual that tells us all about how the microbe might function. Next, we use an enzyme, which can be thought of as a molecular pair of scissors to chop up the DNA into tinier pieces, and then we copy those pieces to speed up our process. Then with the help of a machine and a little molecular magic, we can identify each of the chemical letters, either an A, T, C, or G that belong in the DNA to produce an order 
or a sequence, hence the name genome sequencing. And finally comes the hardest part, putting the puzzle back together. And with the help of computers, we can reconstruct the DNA pieces to make a complete or at least mostly complete genome. And with this information, we can now determine which microbes are in the ecosystem and predict what they might be doing, even if we actually can't see them with our eyes. So I hope that this short introduction into Earth's microbial world has excited you and convinced you all to become scientists. Microbes are incredibly diverse and important for our planet. And we learned that thanks to the complex interactions among some microorganisms in the ocean, the ocean is actually capable of storing up to 50 times more carbon than the atmosphere, helping us to combat climate change. But remember that you too are part of the carbon cycle and can also help to protect our planet. Additionally, we learned that not all viruses are actually bad, even though we're currently living in a pandemic with a pretty bad virus. But many are actually just a natural part of the Earth's ecosystem and play important roles in keeping other organisms in check. And finally, we can thank genome sequencing for many of these discoveries, as it's allowed us to see the unseeable and uncover how these tiny worlds actually rule our big world. In fact, microbiologists estimate that there are as many microbial cells in a handful of soil as there are stars in our galaxy. And viruses, well, they outnumber the stars in the universe by a factor of 10 million. That means there's 10 non-million viruses if you're keeping count. And I've written it out below to show you how large that number actually is. So all of this really means that there's so much left to discover. In fact, there's a whole galaxy worth of microbes waiting not too far away, and we hope that you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elle. Um, and again, to the audience, if there's any questions, uh, now is your time that you can ask Dr. Elle Barnes about anything, about microbes, about her work that you like. And me to get us started, um, you, you were talking a lot about microbes. Um, is there a particular microbe they wanna share that's really exciting? Yeah, there, there's a lot of really exciting microbes that the Joint Genome Institute's working on and in general that people at Berkeley Lab are working on. Um, and there are a number of them that are available on the um, Planktomania app that we just didn't have time to talk about, right? And so one of the microbes that I think is really interesting is, that, uh, is one that's called Micromonas. So Micromonas is another one of those pictoplankton. It's really, really small and it's pear shaped and it lives both in warm and cold waters, which is really interesting because that means they can live almost anywhere in the ocean on the planet. But most importantly, and most interestingly, they have this whip-like tail that makes them really good swimmers. So unlike other microbes that have to wait around for ocean currents to take them somewhere, these uh, Micromonas with their tail are able to swim and don't have to wait for the ocean to take them where they want to go. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess another question is, uh, so sort of how we asked John Marie earlier, you know, how did you end up, you know, right now as a postdoctoral researcher at JGI, what got you interested in pursuing this field? Yeah, so like I think many scientists might tell you, um, I was always kind of interested in science, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And I actually grew up in New York and around New York City. And so I was really interested in how humans, as well as the natural parts of our ecosystem, coexist together and interact. And this led me to studying um, a, a salamander species, actually, and, and its microorganisms and how these microbes might help them combat disease and other environmental problems that they might come in contact with. And so that's really similar to what I'm doing currently at the JGI, working on biofuel crops and how even crops can have a microbiome that exists in the soil. And these microbes can provide plants with new functions that the plant couldn't have done on their own. But with their microbial partners, there's a whole expanse of new things and new um, areas that they can reach within the soil. There you go. That's really cool. Thank you so much, uh, Al, for being here and for sharing about cool e and how microbes run the world. Thank you. 
Thanks. Okay, so uh, next up we have our panel and this little intro of our panelists will pop up in just a bit. Uh, so here we have Ralph Ginty. He is, uh, he studies computational neuroscience at the University of Southern California. And Angel Millard Bruzzo, who studies electrical engineering at Stanford University. And both Angel and Ralph were part of an AP biology class at Boca Raton Community High School, partnered with the Joint Genome Institute on a pilot project to study microbial communities in the Florida Everglades, resulting in a journal article in environmental microbiome. Uh, another panelist we have here today joining us is Daria. She's part of, uh, she is a junior at Skyline High School and part of the Green Energy Pathway. She is also part of the 2020 cohort of the Berkeley Lab Director's Apprenticeship Program and also will be completing an internship at Berkeley Lab this summer. And then we have Sequence Young, um, who is the Green Pathways Program Coordinator for the Berkeley Youth Alternatives. And the Berkeley Youth Alternatives is our featured organization for the Berkeley Lab's 90th anniversary charitable giving initiative. And during the panel sequence, we'll share ways Berkeley Lab STEM ambassadors can get involved as well. So I will stop my share right now. And hopefully all our panelists are here. A uh, sequence, if you can turn on your video, then we can all see you as well. And so first off, sort of get to know all of you more. Um, so Angel and Ralph, can you tell us more about uh, your research experience studying those microbial communities in the Everglades? Yeah, um, so hi, I'm Angel. Um, and the way that I got involved with the Everglades research that Ralph and I were a part of was um, at our high school, we have both an AP biology class and an ACE biology class. Um, one kind of coming after the other. And the teacher for the first year class um, was starting a new program that would be combined within this, this class teaching regular biology topics, but where we would try to conduct research uh, in living in Florida, um, right next to the Everglades. It kind of was just a natural progression sequence to get to studying the Everglades. He reached out, the, uh, our teacher's name was Mr. Benskin. Mr. Benskin reached out to several organizations trying to I guess, um, get them on board with helping 20 high school students conduct actual peer reviewed research. Um, he, he, wanted it, he wanted it to be an actual research experience, um, starting off from knowing absolutely nothing about microorganisms to going into the Everglades, collecting samples, analyzing it, sending the DNA off um, and, and all that. So um, it was really just happened to be, I took the AP biology class and it was offered to me and I looked for the opportunity, applied for it and I was lucky enough to be on add on to it. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Ralph. Uh, yeah, it was just a great experience. Angel kind of explained most of it. And we learned a lot by participating in this research. We had a lot of exposure of what an actual scientist does on a daily basis or what they would do on like a project or and like the whole research process of writing and publishing was a great experience. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and Daria, can you tell us more about um, your research project from the Direct Apprenticeship Program or other things that you do for your green pathways at Skyline High School? Yeah, sure. So last summer, I was a part of the Berkeley Lab National Director's Apprenticeship Program, or BLADP, to shorten it up. And um, we focused on a lot of projects, but at the end, we got to pick one that we wanted to present to like all the volunteers that helped us and to all of our parents. And I presented about um, ecofabs, which are um, ecological fabrications. It's basically a simulated environment for a plant. In our case, it was um, grass. And we had slides, um, glass slides to view the root growth um, using different types of water. So one water with nutrients in it and the other water with salt in it. And we observed the differences between our two grass plants. That's really cool, thank you. Um, and then um, Sequence, uh, you are the Green Pathways Program Coordinator at the Berkeley Youth Alternatives. Can you tell us more about what the student interns do 
uh, there for the program. Of course, so um, the Green Pathways program is a green jobs career prep program. Um, so basically what a general week looks like for us, um, it consists of hybrid instruction. So we work five days a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We split the day between our Roots of Success environmental, environmental literacy curriculum, and then the rest of the afternoon is spent in the garden. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's strictly garden instruction. Thank you for sharing. So these all sound really exciting, very exciting experiences. And it would be interesting to know more um, from the students on what sort of inspired or encouraged you to get involved in STEM research and internships. So we'll start with Daria. Um, were there any defining experiences, let's say in middle school or early high school that led you to be part of the Green Energy Pathway at your high school or then, then led you to join the Director's Apprenticeship Program? Yeah, so um, I have been interested in science um, most of my life, and I, when I found out that UC Berkeley has a UC Berkeley Day, I don't know the exact name of it, but I think it's called UC Berkeley Day, um, where you can go visit the campus and like take tours and learn about different um, programs. I started going to that in like fourth or fifth grade with my dad, and in like eighth grade or um, seventh or eighth grade, I learned about an experience um, with lichen, but I wasn't old enough to do it. I had to be a senior in high school to do that. And that really um, like sparked me to like want to look for more programs. And so when I started at Skyline High School, I had the option of joining the green energy pathway for 10th grade. And I wanted to, I took that chance or I took that choice to, um, take more STEM specific classes such as like sustainability and environmental chemistry and environmental physics. And actually I created a great relationship with my sustainability teacher last year. And she's the one who told me about this program and I'm just super grateful about that. That's great, <laughs> thank you. And thanks to your teacher, I guess, so for you to be part of the program. <laughs> Uh, same question to Ralph. Were there any experiences when you were like a middle schooler or an early or in high school that got you interested in STEM research? I would say um, probably in high school because I had some opportunity to take AP classes and um, AP environmental was a class that kind of opened my eyes to environmental issues. And then ever since then, I kind of got interested in like microbiology as well. And then as that was kind of just a progression of getting into the bio class and taking that research. Cool, and Angel, did, is there, does anything stand out from your time as middle schooler, high schooler? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I started doing science-related extracurriculars my sophomore year, which was only four years ago. Um, and before that, I had never really put my toe into science, but what really drew me in after starting um, was just the collaboration that came along with it. Um, I made entire friend groups from just being in clubs with people that had similar interests. And I realized I had a passion for um, specifically engineering and building, but uh, as well as just working with other researchers on the environmental project um, that Ralph and I were a part of, I loved all of it. Um, and I just really enjoyed being able to collaborate. It's awesome. And yeah, collaboration, definitely a big thing in um, science. And um, so for sequence as um, for the Green Pathways program that you mentioned, uh, can you share with us how, how can students get involved in this program? Absolutely. Um, so most of our um, interns are in-house. Um, they come from our work readiness department. Um, what youth would do to get into that, they would come into Berkeley Youth Alternatives and meet with one of our case managers here. Um, they would enroll in our Roots to our, excuse me, our uh, Steps to Success program, in which what that is, is like general work readiness. So they'll come in, uh, they'll meet with the case manager, the case manager will monitor their education, make sure their grades and everything are good. They'll go through resume writing workshops, et cetera. And they'll go through um, like a quiz. It'll ask them, you know, what their interests are, what they want to do when they go up in the future. Um, and based on that, they'll kind of plug them into internships here. So if a student were to come in and say they have environmental interest, um, they would definitely refer, be referred to my program. 
Um, I'd be happy to provide both my email as well as the case manager that they would need to get in contact with in order to get involved. Thank you. And I guess in thinking about the Berkeley Labs 90th anniversary charitable giving initiative, how can Berkeley Labs STEM ambassadors be engaged with your program? Oh, definitely. Um, what we're really looking for right now um, is interaction and collaboration, really. Um, we offer, like I said, a lot of our own work readiness. We do the urban ag, we do the environmental justice, but we're kind of lacking the environmental science piece. Um, for example, you know, we're outside gardening every day. The students make compost piles and they know what compost is, but they ask me questions all the time about the actual science and breakdown of what's going on inside. And I don't know. So we could really use, you know, some help from you guys to come out and do some workshops with us or however we could partner up. That's awesome. And the links in the chat box uh, for those that are interested in volunteering for this charitable giving initiative. Um, and to the students, I think actually just want to follow up on these experiences that you talked about. Um, one of the things, Angel, that you mentioned was about like the teamwork and, you know, the typical narrative for scientists might be, you know, sort of long days in the lab, working alone, but for what was something that stood out as unexpected about scientific research? So Angel, I'll bring it back to you because you did touch upon the collaboration piece. Of course. Um, yeah, so something that definitely surprised me uh, working on an actual paper that was meant to be peer reviewed and, and published in a journal was just how much of a process it was, but how enjoyable that process can be. Um, from my, my image of what a scientist was came mostly from you know, um, movies and TV shows or books about a scientist working in a lab alone late at night and having this huge breakthrough. Uh, and while those do happen um, and you have great inventions coming from them, most of science I learned was working with labs across the country, working with universities across the country, getting individual researchers, like actual people uh, on board to work with your project. Um, and it's not going to be boring the entire time. You're going to be talking. It's going to be, I think, what was extremely surprising and it was kind of a disconnect before actually participating in research is these are actual people um, and their personalities make their way into the science. They're not, the science is not just numbers um, in writing. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. That's awesome. Uh, Ralph, do you have anything to add on with something that was unexpected in your experience? Um, I guess I would say while I was doing some of like the research in the lab, um, at times it was kind of hard to follow through all the steps and instructions, but our instructor and my other teammates were always there helping me, you know, get to the next step and finish it. And we eventually got it done, which was such a great feeling. It's very fulfilling to do research. That's awesome. Yeah, that's nice of people help each other out in science. And Daria, was there anything unexpected in your experiences? Yeah, so um, in the Berkeley um, Lab Director's Apprenticeship Program, we um, worked with a lot of scientists from the Berkeley Lab, um, and they were from all different like sections of the lab, like computer science, environmental science, biology, everything. And it was really interesting that, like to me that they had worked with each other before. I thought that each like section of the lab was separate and like they only did their own thing, but they worked across like the board with like um, collaborating on projects like for coding and things like that. And I thought that was really interesting. It's really cool to hear. Yeah, okay. so. Um... Of course, we're a bit over, so thank you to our audience that are sticking with us um, through the time. But um, we are at our last question, and this is for everyone. You know, what advice do you want to share to students, you know, who want to get involved in STEM research and internships? What advice would you share to them? And I'll start with a sequence. What advice would you like to give students who want to get involved in STEM research and internships? My advice would be to really just explore. I feel like um, kids a lot of times like have ideas and hear about things and it's quick to like make an assumption on something before you try it. But um, 
with my experience, I get a lot of kids to come in and they might think they don't like something, but once they actually get their hands into it and like start doing it, they find the love for it. So I would say like, you know, just explore your options, find as many programs as you can, um, you know, just try different things out and just, just don't have a close mind to it. Explore, exploration, trying out new things, great advice. Ralph, do you have some advice you'd like to share? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is really to just challenge yourself. It's really important to not set limits on your mind and your mindset. Like a lot of students may say, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at science, but that's not necessarily true. It's really important to just try classes and work hard as much as you can in school so you can have those avenues open for you later on. Great. Um, and Angel, anything, any other advice you'd like to tack on for students? Yeah, um, I think something that was kind of hard for me going going into science um, as a 14 year old, 15 year old was thinking, I have no experience. I'm, I don't mean to be here, um, you know, and I think it's just important to keep in mind that there is no right time or wrong time to start exploring your passion of science, regardless of what that science is. Um, everyone starts from a different different area. I had no one in my life that had ever done science, um, no family, like no authority figures, but I just thought that I'd enjoy it. So I, I looked for those teachers and I looked for um, people that could help me out and they're going to be understanding. So I think just ask your teachers, ask your family if, they, if they're into it um, and know that like there's no right or wrong time. Good advice. Finally, Daria, any advice you'd like to share with students? I think being like friends with your teachers is really important. I wouldn't have heard of this program if I hadn't gone to my sustainability teacher at like lunch and talked to her about homework and um, just like talk to her, I guess, in general. And again, in like physics this year, I uh, went to office hours with my teacher and she like, helped me um, understand a lot of important programs in STEM and things like that. And so just having that relationship with teachers and mentors is really important. Mentorship can really take a person a long way. That's great advice. So thank you, uh, Ralph, Angel, Daria, and Sequence for being part of our panel today and for sharing all this amazing advice, your experiences. And I would like to also thank our presenters from earlier, John Marie and Elle for being part of our live science session today. I'd also like to thank our audience for sticking with us and we hope to see you all at a future live science session. I hope everyone has a fantastic Friday and a wonderful weekend. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you everyone, bye. <laughs>